One of the reasons that I put a lot of cats in my slides is because you end the session and you're just like, man, I really, I just feel good. Um, here's my cats. This is Pistachio. She clearly does not believe anything I'm going to say. Um, and then the other one is named Squeaks because she squeaks. It's, she actually makes a noise like her name, which is convenient. Okay, so um, today I'm gonna talk about Agile. Yeah, no, actually not. That, you just have to put that in all talks that are about teamwork. Um, what I do kind of want to talk about, though, is this concept of, of sort of agility and what agility is all about. Agility is really that process of being able to rapidly change, being able to adjust as you're going forward. This is that core of a lot of the agile methods. And it's all based on this idea of feedback. And the feedback is such a vague sense and a vague word and a vague sort of idea. I, I like to think of it in more of a terms of a specific thing. And that specific thing is that all of my process, all of the things that I try to get my team to do or that I try to do, is I try to minimize the time between doing something and figuring out if it was the right thing to do. All the way at like the coding level where you might be writing your tests first, um, all the way up to your process level, your team process level, doing retrospectives, figuring out we wanted to do something, we tried a new technique, let's figure out if that was the right thing to do. And if it wasn't the thing to do, let's adjust it. And this, this is, brings to sort of one of the reason I'm doing this talk is that there's this difference between sort of the methodologies, the sort of agile methodologies versus this just pure idea of agility. Dave Thomas, the Pragmatic Programmers, talks about this agility, and there's a lot of talks where he goes into really dissecting agile in there. And in all of the methodologies there's this key phrase, there's this key thing. It lays out, you know, XP lays out test-driven development and continuous integration and Scrum has stand-ups and they lay out this way of doing your process. Here's how you develop software. Here's how your team should work. And then at the end, they talk, they say, oh, and you should periodically inspect and adapt. You should periodically stop look at your process and figure out what's working or what's not working. What I find both in my past and in the current is that this is often left off. If you were here for Linda's talk, she's sort of pushing the other way is you should be doing this all the time. But often what happens is you get into a team, they say, we do daily stand-ups, we do all the scrum stuff, and you just keep doing it. And then, then people start complaining that the stand-ups are too long. The stand-ups are 20 minutes. They're 30 minutes. They've turned into status meetings, but nobody is actually saying, let's stop, inspect, and adapt. So this is really the core of having a fixed methodology versus the context-specific practices, where you start with Scrum, you start with XP, that's your fixed set of practices, your fixed methodology. And that's great. You should start with something. But then you always want to look at what your context is. And you want to stop, inspect, and adapt your context. So in this talk, I've, you know, in the past, I've given talks about like very high level, let's, here's some ideas and things like that. But I want to really talk about examples. I'm going to talk about a couple examples from the last two companies I've been working at as to where we kind of started with something, found our context didn't work for it, and then we changed. We did something different, something that wasn't what was prescribed or something that didn't even work, might not have worked at other places. And so we stopped and we said, 
we can use different techniques because our context is different. We have a different context. And it all came about because periodically we said, this isn't working. So this talk is very much examples. There's, this is probably the last of the sort of philosophical aspects of it or the vague aspects of it. I'm a little bit about me. That's not me. That squeaks. Um, Oh, her little eyes. She sleeps with me every night. It's wonderful. Um, so I'm a software developer. I got introduced to extreme programming in 2004. Um, currently the CTO of a company called Harkin. Um, we have a very small team. There's three developers. There's nine people in the company. Um, we build software and best practices for newsrooms to engage with their audience. It's a really interesting, uh, interesting business model. Um, I always like to put my humble slide here of like, I don't have all the answers, only experiences. Um, I actually do have all the answers. Um, so if you have any questions at the end, I can, I will give you an answer. Absolutely. I have an answer for every question. Um, and if you ha if you didn't know, if you didn't follow me on Twitter or anything like that, I do love cats. Um, Speaking of which, there they are. Look at them. I bought this red chair. It's a very leather recliner, super fancy. Um, and now it has holes, little tiny holes. I don't know where they're coming from, but little tiny holes in them all over the place. Um, but I haven't actually sat in it in a long time because, as you can see, somebody else sits in it. Um, so examples, these are the examples. The first example I want to talk about is around planning. And I'm kind of, this is sort of the, the sort of umbrella of the examples is really about planning, um, not about necessarily the, the concrete techniques we use for developing software on the day-to-day -day sort of minute-by-minute -minute basis. But this is one of the things that I've noticed for myself, I've gotten a lot more value out of when during, for the planning meetings, I really sort of look at the techniques we're using and figure out what we can do um, to do different. There's two companies. One is called Power Reviews. One is called Hargan. I'll give you a little sense of them. Um, Power Reviews, which was the company I worked at previously, small. We had 20 people. Um, we had the interesting thing about this company is that it was very small, but we have five different sort of stakeholders all asking the dev team to work on this platform. It was a single platform. We had three developers, five stakeholders, all different. So we had, you know, who did we have? We had sales, we had content, we had marketing, we had whatever. It was, it was interesting. So Power Reviews at the time, it, what it was was a company that did um, online ratings and reviews for products. And so people would come to the website and they would leave a rating or a review for a product. And so all of these stakeholders would come and ask us for things. And one of the first things when I joined there was that I was often, we would be getting asked like, um, how long is this gonna take? I need this to get done. How long is this gonna take us? And so we had a problem. We had three developers. We had only one who knew the code base. We were lucky because the one developer who knew the code base, had been, he actually did the very first commit on the code base five years earlier. But the rest of us had no, didn't have any familiarity with it. And one of our developers was very much a junior. And so this brings up that question of how do you estimate when you have this context? And I'm not going to get into the whole like no estimates kind of argument or, or discussion around it. It's really when you are in a context, there's oftentimes people are asking you that question. And so they ask you, how do you estimate? But what I will say is that in our context, I sat down with all of the stakeholders and I told them, this is the wrong question. It's not that estimation is the wrong thing to do, but how are we going to estimate is the wrong question. The right question is why would we estimate? 
estimate? Why would we give you estimates? What value are you actually going to be looking for? What value do you get out of this? And of course, we have the standard answers of, I want to know when it's going to be done. I'm salesperson. I want to know, can I get this in time? I've promised this to the people that I've sold stuff to. So we looked at it and we started talking about what are the values and can we provide that in a different way? And so we sat and we talked. We sat down and we talked about this idea of deadline versus scope. We said, you have a deadline of when you want this done. We are three developers. We can't promise you that we can get everything done in that time frame. So you've got this choice. You can either have a deadline or you can have the scope. This is sort of part of that. You've, I'm sure you've all seen that graph or the triangle of, what is it, quality, scope, and time. Pick two, I think, I think they do it. And so we've all probably seen it because we watch these talks and it's a common one. Um, I was going to put the Agile Manifesto in here, but then I figured you've probably seen that a few times, this talk or this conference. Um, but we've all seen that pyramid. So what we did was instead we talked about this idea of taking the feature that they want and we split it into a bunch of small tasks, a bunch of small features. We don't talk about how long it's going to take. We just talk about the key pieces that are in there. And at that point, we can focus instead on the scope. And we can tell them, you can have your deadline. Now let's talk about which of these things we have to get done by then. Which of these things should we do first? Because you're not going to get all of them. And just flat out be able to say, here's the 10 things that you want. You don't get all of them. Which are the ones that you want? and which are the ones that you would like us to do first. And this is really about sequencing. And it has, we end up not having to do estimation. We just have to be able to do them in order. And the beauty of this that really comes in as sort of the value that the team gets out of it is that oftentimes you don't, you don't end up doing everything. You just do what you can, and as the deadline approaches, they, the stakeholders, the people who are asking you, they're the ones who get to make the decision. They're the ones who get to say, my deadline's coming up, there's enough done. Like, I'm willing to say this is okay, I can take this. And then you can take those other things and push them onto the backlog. This is a... a example of one of my usual principles is that when I find a problem with my process, when I find something that I'm struggling with in the process, my default answer is to remove something from my process. So we were having problems with estimation. So what we did was we just said, let's remove that specific thing from our process and replace it with something else that we're already doing, which was we were working on cards. So can we get the same value by adjusting something that we already are doing? Probably shouldn't put a picture of my cat next to the thing that says prefer removing something. But I guess she kind of has that good look of like, really? So anyways. Number two, this is a slightly larger one, and this is more interesting. We'll go over both kind of both companies, is how many of you do like a two-week, have a two-week planning meeting? Or how many do like one-week planning meeting? How many people have moved all the way to just like continuous planning and you do like Kanban boards and whips, things like that? Do they still say whips? I always like that of like having a, having a limit based on a whip. Um, okay, so... This was the problem we faced. This was the core problem that we faced, was that we had five stakeholders. We technically had a single platform, but we kind of had three products. We had a content blog. We had a, a, a moderation tool. Because in, at this company, and in general, 
if you go on to sites that do ratings and reviews, all of the reviews have been seen by a human. All the reviews, most all the reviews that you read online have been read and moderated by a human. And that's a lot. That's an expensive process too because you have people who are sitting there looking through your system or looking through and reading every single review that somebody writes and being able to say spam or not spam or something like that. So we have five stakeholders. We have three products. Everybody, we would have our two-week meeting. Everyone would bring their cards. These are the things that we want and everyone would vote on them. And generally, the loudest person gets their cards prioritized because they're the ones who are talking and they overdo it. And in general, that's sales. And it's not just because I'm not saying salespeople are loud, but they're able to like, well, we're sales. We're the ones who bring money in. We're the ones that like, so we have this idea. We want to do this because we think that it's going to make us a lot of money. And that's not a bad thing, but they tend to be the loud ones, and they're the ones who tend to get their stuff prioritized. So I made a little animation of it, just because I can do animations in Keynote. Um, so we had all of these people, and our fundamental problem was that sales and content and moderation and technology and data, all these people were putting things into this prioritization queue, and our goal was to get the cards in order so that we could, this small team, two seniors and a junior, could just pick off the top and start working on it. So in our meetings, we started realizing that this is a problem. This whole idea of prioritization of our cards was a problem because when you talk about prioritization, you talk about what's most important. And generally what's most important is the thing that the person who's the loudest says is the most important or the person who's most highly paid. So we questioned this fundamental idea of what priority means and got and t you know, brought the stakeholders in the room and said, why do we need to prioritize these things? And inevitably what they end up saying is that we want to work on the most valuable things first, the things that are valuable for the company. So as a team, we looked at this idea. This is the, I don't know, I'm sure there's a fancy term for it, but it is the sort of value time quadrant thing. How many people have seen this sort of chart before? Okay. So you want to get, so you have sort of how long it's going to take, and then you have value on this side. And you want to get short things that can be done shortly that are high value. Of course, the problem is, is that, you know, gauging value and gauging time and all of that, we'd already given up estimation, a little, so we were having trouble with time. But there's this, there's this guy named Arlo Belshi, who if you haven't seen anything he's done, or if you haven't seen everything he's done, then you should. And if you're watching this as a recording, you can stop go watch everything Arlo's done and come back. Because I'm, I'm back, thank you. Welcome back. Um, wonderful. Every time I watch him talk, like my, the way I develop software fundamentally changes. So, absolutely. So one of the things that he talked about that I brought in was this idea that value of something, if you look at this square, and you, look, and you talk about how, much it, how valuable it is to the company, and then you look at this one, or even this one, value tends to increase at a much more rapid pace than time. So it usually, oftentimes, will go, like, this will be worth you know, $10,000 to the company. This one will be worth $1,000 to the company. You tend not to have... $10,000 and 9000 you tend to have large gaps between them. In fact, they tend to be, you know, more sort of exponential kind of growth in the value of your, of your features. Whereas time, time is almost always linear. Time is almost always, this is going to take one week versus three weeks. And so you have 
the value of features growing. This is maybe 10 or 100 times more valuable than another feature. Whereas the time tends to be that it's going to take you another, you know, an extra two weeks to do it. And whenever you have sort of graph of something that is rapidly growing or exponential even, and something that is linear, you can always get rid of the linear part of it and just talk about value and just think in terms of what is the value of this feature to the card. And so if you think about it this way, you can simply bring everything in put the value on the card and just order them that way and forget totally how long things are going to take. And of course, you split them up into the small pieces so that when you get that value, you don't have to do the rest. And this is something we did. Now, that brings up another challenge, which is how do you do value-based sequencing? What is a value? So what we did was we actually were in a situation where we said, in order to bring a card in, you have to have a dollar value on it, a monetary financial value, either earned or saved. And here's an example of one that wasn't going to get sequenced. Moderators, our moderators, uh, the ones who look at the reviews and say whether or not it's good. We had a problem in that one of the things they looked for were fraudulent reviews reviewers who would write 10 good reviews for something and would make money. In order to find out if it was fraudulent, they took four steps. They would have to click the name in the tool to get the IP address, navigate to the search page, put in the IP address, and then they would look to see how many reviews they had. Not a huge thing, but they, they you know, it was a pain. And so they would bring this card, the moderation team brought this card all the time, and it never got sequenced. It would just not get sequenced because sales would come in and they'd be like, we have this big thing that we're working on, this big project that we're working on. So I sat down with them and we said, let's look at this. Let's look at every review. It takes 20 seconds to do this per review. We do about 200 reviews per day for a reviewer. Add it up to about an hour a day. We, we have 75 reviewers. It's $1,500 a day that we could immediately begin getting and saving if we had a small change that took this 20-second process down to like a second. Or if we added, I, we ended up adding a little flag, a little red flag on the thing if it had more than one review for that IP address. And so by bringing in money, this got sequenced because everybody voted for it. Like it was sitting there and it was like, we're going to immediately, the day we roll this out, we start saving $1,500 a day. And oddly enough, we did. And we got it. So this is an example of something you can do and it got sequenced. And it broke this sort of loudness problem of prioritization. And of course, we hear there's, there's pushback against this sort of thing of like, you can't, this couldn't work in my place. We can't do financial stuff. And I always tell people, it might not. In fact, it probably won't work in your place, but you won't know until you try it. And this is how we try every experiment at our place, is we say, we, this may not work, but it, we're going to try it. And we always put that time frame. Let's try it for two months. And key, the thing I've found that is so important is to actually put the meeting on the calendar for when you're going to decide if you keep doing it. So it's not just let's try it for two months and then we'll see. It's we have a meeting because if somebody comes and complains about it not working or they don't like it, you can say, you know, two weeks, we're going to have a meeting. We have the meeting there. And people generally are like, well, okay, I can do it for two more weeks. We'll see. And then you have the meaning, you make the decision. It's a, a big technique that somewhere along the line, <laughs> it's a simple thing to pick up. Um, the other thing that I wanted to give an example of is the same sort of idea of planning. For my current company, Harkin, we're tiny. We've only been around for about a year and a half. 
We have nine people. We started, there were three of us at the beginning, two developers and our CEO. Now we're at nine. It's, we're growing. It's great. We're going to be profitable next year. Who's ah? Oh, wait, is this being recorded? I better not. Uh... People are going to come back and catch me on. That'll be the part of this talk people catch me on. So the thing, the different context we have here is that we have only one stakeholder for a single product. We pretty much have a product that we're putting out, and our CEO is the main sort of uh, thought leader around it, so they're bringing in this. We do have customers who are feeding us back, but the, all of it funnels in through sort of the same place. And we again have three developers, except in this situation we have two developers who have been developing software for more than 20 years. We have another one who's around seven or eight years. Like We have a much better team. I've also probably had my hand in almost every line of the code base. Same with the other senior developer. So we have this amazingly different context. And so when we started doing the planning, we started with no estimation because you know, there wasn't really a sense of, of what it, why do we actually need to have estimates. Um, we started with a weekly planning meeting because we were moving very quickly. Um, and we had the start stakeholders sequence the tasks. So we would use Trello. We'd come into our weekly meeting and the, we would ask the stakeholders, like, is this the next one you want us to do? Is this a higher priority? And we'd always, I'd, I'd had this whole like grand, wonderful way of doing it. I would take the card and I would be like, is it more important than this other one? Is it less important than this other one? And we'd go through this big, long process. And we would get it sort of prioritized but we ran into a bunch of problems. Like, we can't talk about the value because it's money. Like, we're, we're a small, small company. We're just starting this product. We don't actually, at the time, we didn't have a lot of customers. We still don't have a lot of customers. So we can't really talk about money. And so, and, and sequencing, when, you, when you're at an early stage, Sequencing, like I would say, like, is this more important? And people would be like, yeah, sure. Like, we have to get all of it done. It does, like, we have to get it all done. Why are we doing this? And I, like, it would rarely change. Like, we would just, it just became this hour long or half an hour long, depending on how many cards, just waste of a week or a waste of a time because we'd come in there and, and, go through this rigorous planning process and nobody cared about the priority. People cared whether the stuff was getting, like, is it going to get done or not? And it'd be like, well, yeah, everything's going to get done eventually. And that was good enough. So we ended up just throwing that away and replacing the weekly planning meeting with communication. We all were together. We were on Slack all the time talking and all that. And so what we found was that the weekly, the sort of weekly prioritization meeting, you know, we had small team, so we talked to each other all the time, so we kind of had a sense of what was really important. And we went back to this idea, this core thing that has stuck with me since I got sort of introduced or inducted into the religion of Agile or XP, is that this idea that story cards are a placeholder for communication. I've been at places where we, the story needed to have acceptance criteria and the story had to have all of this stuff around it because there was not good communication. Well, our team had the context where we were talking all the time. And so we ended up making it where a story card specifically had just a title, there was very little, if any, detail in it. If, there, if it was a bug, there might be like a screenshot. But what would happen is that developers, when they drew a card, the expectation was that they would go talk to the person who had put the card in and figure out what all the details were. And one of the things that came out of it is that we ended up having this expectation that when you took a card, that card became more than one. 
Like as you found more information about what the feature was or what the request was, you would take cards and shed them off into the backlog. And so you would do this idea of taking something that you don't know anything about and break it up into all of the small pieces. And so you'd sort of fill up the backlog with the details. And it ended up, it fit along with some other things we did, like we would, uh, we started doing uh, uh, what we called short-lived code branches. So in Git, in our source repository, uh, branches got deleted after a day if they weren't merged into master. And so every branch had one day. And if you didn't, then we just cleaned it up, deleted it, and you had to start over. Um, and now we're at, surprisingly, we did that. That was another time box thing we did. And we said, let's try it for a month. At the end of the month, it, we sat down, the three developers, and we were like, what do you think? And everyone just like, works great. It's fun. And we would end up splitting cards up quite a bit. So what our, what our weekly planning ended up is that the developers would come and we would present the sequence. We've talked to everybody through the week. We know what we're doing. This is kind of what we're going to do this week. Anyone have objections? And rarely, sometimes, if there was something we didn't know about, a, a, a really a big bug or something, um, someone would say, yeah, I have an objection. I need this done right away. And at that point, we could sort of interrupt and put that in there. And then we'd be done. And so the sort of weekly planning became more of a weekly report, like weekly sharing meeting. And it took like, I don't know, five minutes. Part of another meeting. It became part of another team meeting where we said, this is what we think we're going to do this week. And everyone was just like, okay. Because we sat down and looked at what we were doing and found the things that none of us liked and just got rid of them. So we then got to where we were building what we're doing now, which is we're actually building a new product. And we started continuing to do this. We split it up. We had lots of features to build. Sequencing was difficult even for developers because there was no context. It was just features of a new product. Um, what we did start doing was having a Friday showcase of demoing the product. Like, where is it at so far? Like, what can it do? Look, you can subscribe to the notebook now. And look, look, you can upload a photo or you can crop a photo. We can't upload it yet. Can't save it, but you can crop it. So we would have these like showcases every week of it. Plus, we were using a new language and a new framework. Elm, how many people have heard of Elm? How many people have done Elm? <sighs> awesome, right? Yeah, amazing. If you haven't done it yet, do it. Elm is great. I always say it's Haskell without the academia, which is super nice. Um, and nobody ever mentions monads. Just another wonderful thing. OK, so let's not talk about Elm. Um, so we switched to an idea of script-based planning. This was actually our, our front-end developer, our designer's idea. He said, since we are doing a weekly showcase, why don't we simply um, write a script for that every week? What is it, what's the script look like that we're going to walk through for Friday? Let's go through the script and see what the system does do already and what it doesn't do already. And then the whole point of the week is to work on the product until it does what it doesn't do. And so Friday, we can show the script. And we just walk through the script. So we completely threw away the whole like sequencing and all of that of cards. We still move cards along for our own edification. But all of the planning is about what are we going to showcase? Because we're under development. We're hoping to get it done soon. The other benefit of this with a new product is that the stakeholders, at a point, they're going to be able to use it. They're going to be seeing it in action, not just what got done. They're actually going to see a script run through of what you can do with the product. And at that point, they may say, I could use it now regardless of what your original plan was. It's like, hey, 
it's got everything. People can subscribe. I can upload pictures. Everything's happy. And so this became our, like, this is the process we use now. As we're building this, we're probably going to be building this through the end of the year. And so our goal is to have it into general release at, by the end of the year. So we're going to do this script-based thing. Now, after we have that out, that's no longer the right thing. So we go back to sort of the story-based and the feature-based thing after you release the product because you always want to stop and adjust to the part that works. So this is kind of the, the whole summary and the whole point of all of this is that you are special. Even though people will tell you you're not a special snowflake, I'll tell you that too. But you are special. Your team's special. Your context is special. If you do these time-based experiments based on your context, always go back and very frequently stop and say, what are the things that I don't like about this? And rather than saying, I don't like, like it, ask your team, what happens if we just don't do it? Like we took our stand-ups and we moved our stand-ups. Our stand-ups started standing up. Then we were in Slack and we were answering those damn three questions of what did you do yesterday? What are you going to do today? What's, what's in your way? How many people ask that question at your stand-up? Oh, not very many. How many people do stand-ups every day? Oh, great. So we started doing that, and we started doing that in Slack, and we realized that, like, no, we're, you know, we read them, but we, we talk all the time in Slack, all the time. Like, I'm typing in Slack. It feels like all the time. And so having that morning, like what's the goal of that morning, those three questions. So what we switch to is we switch to one question, which is what are you doing today and why? Because any blocker you're having, you've already talked to the people. The, only, the most important thing is understanding why you're doing what you think you're going to do today, both for an internal process and an external to everybody else. Because then people can come in and say, hey, I think that might not be the most important thing. And everybody knows what you did yesterday because we're talking all the time. And so we've done that. We've switched to, we actually, in the dev team, we've moved back into having a little video call every day because the two developers are, where the three of us are remote. So we have a little video call. We moved out of the Slack stand-up and into a video call that's like two or three minutes long because we're remote and we never get to see each other. And we thought, wow, I haven't seen, heard this person's voice in a little while. So why don't we make it so that we see each other's face every day? Because we, we pair a couple times a week, but it still feels distant when you're remote. So context matters. And the context, your context changes over time. So... I'm, one thing that I'm not really, well, lots of things. One thing I'm not really great at is sort of ending. So that's the end. <laughs> um, remember to rate the session. Um, when you are rating the session, think of my cats, Squeaks and Pistachio. Um, I also wrote a book, and I saw somebody else put it up there. I was like, I should put a, put a picture of my book up there. Um, it's a programming book. Um, about the four rules of simple design. Great book. Take pictures of it. Oh. Um, great book. So you can buy it. Um, yeah. Thank you. Enjoy. I think there's time for questions. I, I yeah. purposefully left Indeed. 10 minutes for questions. Indeed. Thank you, Corey. We've got time for questions. Anyone? Anyone? Awesome. Hey. Okay. Oh. Hi, thank you for your talk. I'm interested about the time boxed experiment. Mm -hmm. um, how defined is it in the beginning? Um, and do you, do you allow for the experiment to evolve during the time box period? It's a good question. So the question is, when you are doing a time boxed experiment, how defined is the experiment at the beginning? 
And over the course of the time box, do you allow for it to evolve and change? Um, it depends. No. Um, it does depend on if it is like, so when we tried to do short-lived branches, we said we're going to delete our branches every day. You have one day to get this task done, and if you don't get it done, you have to start over. We didn't allow for change to that, because it was the more defined you can make it, then the less change there needs to be, because you want to, uh, you want to see, does this hypothesis hold true? The key is figuring out what an appropriate time is more than can we change it. Because if you're saying, like, we're going to change our two-week planning meeting, you don't want your time box to be two weeks. It needs to be six weeks, um, two months, something like that. And the times when it's, uh, for me, the times when it's allowed to, like, make some improvements on it are when you try it and it's awful. Like, it's really bad. Um, then don't stick with it. I mean, if it's horrible. But if it's just like, oh, this is uncomfortable. Um, but I'm not very, like, you have to stick with it. This is science or something. I mean, if, it's, if you have ideas for making it better, the whole goal is to end the time box with a learning. And if you end the time box having changed the, the experiment to the point where it's great then success. Um, but the one thing to watch out for is before you have a time to experience it, like if you're doing something that you're going to get a feel for on a day, like you're doing something daily, like we're going to change our stand-up. And um, after a day, somebody's like, this sucks. Like hold, hold for a couple weeks. Um, the, the big key is, is that time. Like, set a meeting on your calendar as soon as you start the experiment so that everybody knows when it is that you're going to make the decision. And if you do, in general, people are pretty laid back. Um, any other questions? Everybody wants to run outside? It's sunny out. No. Okay. Oh, is there? Okay. Hey. Um, I was wondering about the, um, the demo, the Friday demo, mm -hmm. and then you talked about the scripts. I was wondering what, what form does the script take? Is it just a list over everything you want the system to have, and then you sort of fill it out, or? Let me show you. Um, uh, yeah, um, there's this wonderful um, Chrome plugin called See if this is this it. Um, this wonderful Chrome plugin that serves up a picture from the Met, the Metropolitan Museum, that has a cat. So it, it just knows all the pictures that have cats in them. And then whenever you start a new tab, it um, here it is. Iron. It'll show you a new picture of the cat. It's, um, so basically, it looks like this. It's like, add items to dispatch. And so it starts with like, hey, Ellen's going to log in. She's going to go to the workspace. And then like, this is the thing we're hoping to be able to do, is create items. And then we just do this. So it's, it's very ad hoc. Um, we'll have a list of like, um, what are the goals? What's missing? Um, what are stretch goals for it? Don't I look classy? Things like that. Um, yeah, look, see, it's another. Here's another cat picture. Another one. It's a really great plugin. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? No. Oh, awesome. All right. Enjoy the rest of the day. Please remember to rate the speaker. Thank you, yes, Corey. Great.